I have some questions for the speakers. So, uh, first question for Seba. Um, uh, you have a patient, you have a young patient, 40 years old, with a family history for prostate cancer, and he has also a prostatitis. Would you suggest a diet? Would you suggest to take something? What would you suggest from a particular point of view? I, I will speak with him because uh, what we know is that 5-R is, is capable, is able to re reduce the risk of Gleason score 6. We are sure of it. We are not sure if diet, supplements, vitamins are able to reduce the risk. So if he is interested in a real chemo prevention, I think that an off-label use of 5 uh, R is uh, a good thing. Because I firmly, um, I am com com convinced that uh, the problem of the eye grade is a bias uh, from the design of the study. There is a lot of uh, information, uh, Professor Mar Marberger showed it, uh, that uh, it's difficult that the five areas uh, are uh, able uh, to promote uh, high grade, uh, um, high grade the cancer. I think that the uh, REDEEM study is very important because REDEEM study is, I think, is more likely, is more similar to REDUCE study. REDUCE study probably they are cancer not detected. REDEEM study are cancer detected. REDUCE study are big, pro big uh, prostate. They, uh, there is a BPH volume in REDEEM study probably there is not this kind of problem, and uh, the bias from the volume is uh, uh, less important. And in redeem study, you don't find any I-grade, uh, I-grade BCR. So <clears throat> I think that uh, the benefit risk balance of the FDA is not fair. Uh, I have to explain it to the patient. Uh, I have to do. Um, unfortunately, and if he want, I think it's better if he take a five hours. If you, if he prefer some some diet, what what kind of diet? Don't don't eat red red uh, meat. Uh, eat fish, perhaps. Uh, low fat grab, low fat diet, perhaps. Some supplement, perhaps. I don't know. You can you can do it. I I I do it. And so I I I'm not fat. So, Professor Motosi, what would you do in the same patient? Young patient, family history, normal PSA. I, I don't know whether we should speak English or, or Italian for the audience, but I think that everybody understands. And so Mike can be part. Half and half. One word in English, one word in Italian. La, la domanda di Enzo era allora cosa fare in un ragazzo giovane che ha, una, ha un PSA eh, normale. Eh, io penso che se si voglia considerare, a me è stato dato il compito del, del, di parlare di finasteride e dutasterile, questi farmaci si deve rimanere legati al, agli studi che abbiamo a disposizione. Per quello che riguarda la dutasteride si tratta sempre di pazienti che consideriamo a rischio per un tumore che hanno fatto una biopsia che è venuta negativa. E in questi casi al paziente oggi ancora continuo ad offrire come possibilità il trattamento con la dutasteride spiegando loro che si aspetteranno un calo del PSA, che il calo lo si vedrà presumibilmente andare avanti per un bel pezzo e che il valore del farmaco è quello, tra le altre cose, di tenere poi il PSA stabile. Se questo PSA si dovesse alzare, può essere un segnale brutto e quindi devono ripetere le biopsie, con poi gli accorgimenti che vi ho detto. Se il PSA mm. rimane basso, io non chiedo di fare le biopsie, se non si muove. Però mi rendo conto che vado contro al protocollo di Redus. Però ho sempre fatto questo, ho visto un paio di casi nel tempo di alti gradi che abbiamo poi operato, ma gli alti gradi si vedono comunque, per cui da questo non permette di dire allora non va bene il medicinale. Per cui non darei Enzo al cinquantenne con un PSA di 2 la finasteride o, o la dutasteride, ma nel caso in cui avesse fatto il, la biopsia e fosse negativa, sicuramente discuto con lui le possibilità. E a questo punto diventa d'obbligo domanda 
ehm, ogni quanto ripeti il PSR, <coughs> ogni tre mesi, ogni quattro mesi, ogni sei mesi e dopo quando eh, ripeti la biosia, cioè un incremento del 5, del 10, del 15% del PSA? Il, il, il primo PSA quando vengono messi in terapia lo faccio sempre fare a distanza di sei mesi, tipicamente il secondo PSA lo faccio fare a distanza di sei mesi, quando il PSA è ancora o in discesa o in stabile gli direi di farlo a distanza di un anno, cioè lo considero un paziente qualunque, Beh. anche perché poi bisogna lasciarli anche vivere questi malati, certo. sono poveretti. Non... Io volevo agganciarmi a quello che diceva Chicco e poi volevo fare una domanda a Michele. C'è una Valdagna che voleva fare una Prima domanda. in italiano e poi te la faccio in inglese. Cioè, eh, eh, noi abbiamo detto, non è sicuro, the correlation between eh, finasteride and eh, high grade tumor. Bene. Poi abbiamo anche detto, facciamo trattamento con tutasteride e aspettiamo il nadir. After six, six months, o after 12 months, vediamo. Bene. Poi, dopo il nadir, il PSA, rising PSA. A questo punto, Michael dice, fourth predictor of cancer. Not only this, ma dice, for strong predictor of high grade cancer, prostatic cancer. Quindi, questo è un po' inquietante. Quindi non è solo un forte predittore di un tumore. Come dici tu, va bene, se c'è il nadir, il PSA alta, il sospetto che ci sia il tumore. Quindi, I have to do biopsy in this case. Well, I, I, I must. But you said that strong predictor of high-grade prostatic cancer is a little bit different. No, the, the, uh, the, uh, forget the thought the was a misunderstanding. It's not a strong predictor. I would put it another way. It, it, it raises the red flag. What you do depends on the patient. You have a patient who has a PSA of 1.2, and he goes to 1.4, and after a year to 1.5, and he's 73 years old. So what? But he has a PSA of originally 8, he did a biopsy, it was negative, he came down, and then he came down to 4, and then he goes to 4.5 and 5.5, and he is 62. That's a different story. It's, I, take a, forget the word faulty, I didn't say faulty. Uh, it's not a strong, it's a, it raises the red flag, there is something wrong. It can never exclude cancer, we had three cases that didn't produce any PSA, But that's prostate cancer. But I would like to come back to your case. I think that today, if we have a 45-year-old man, first of all, we have a different understanding of what is normal PSA at that, age, uh, at that age from the Scandinavian studies. He should have a PSA under one. If he has a PSA over one, He's already at a higher risk of developing prostate cancer in the future, and he needs follow-up. That's the first issue. The second, most of these patients that have prostatitis have a higher PSA, and they usually also have a higher prostate volume. They have a bigger prostate. Now, a high PSA and a high prostate volume are already a good indication for progression of benign prostatic disease. That is already a clear indication for treatment with a 5-alpha reductase inhibitor. But you should exclude prostate cancer, and the way to do that is with a biopsy. So if I put a patient on a long-term treatment today who has an elevated PSA in the large prostate at that point, I will do a biopsy before I give him a 5-alpha reductase inhibitor. But if the biopsy is negative, he has, in the reduced trial, that's typical for this population, we had 9% acute urinary retention in four years in the placebo arm. He has a high risk of progressive LUTs and progressive problems from his BPH. Plus, we're also reducing the number of at least low-risk prostate cancers. And we can pick up, and I'm quite convinced that, high-grade cancers even 
earlier, and the REDEEM trial has underlined that. So it is what we call clinical judgment. There is no rule. You have an increase of 0.2, you have to do a biopsy. You look at the patient, you look at the confounding factors, you look at his risk factors, at his age, and what he wants, and then you do a clinical judgment decision. No forte. <laughs> Last question, Ricardo. Very quickly, please. I mean, if we consider the experience of hormonal therapy, neoadjuvant hormonal therapy uh, with radiation, we know that the decrease, okay, the nadir of, the, of PSA pre-radiation therapy is a strongly prognostic factor. So, as you can imagine, the lowest is equivalent to better survival, better local control. But not only the nadir, also the decremental slope, so the time uh, needed to reach that specific nadir. Have you tried to compare this in the ARIS studies Mm -hmm. And, and one mo more important thing, consider that radiation oncologists use it, um, a new adjuvant, uh, essentially in high risk patient. So it could be useful to compare, even if we are talking of uh, LHRH or uh, anti-androgens, it could be useful to compare the casistics. Well, first of all, the difference between reaching nadir in new adjuvant hormonal treatment plus radiotherapy versus no therapy is about eight months versus uh, 17 months, mean until you reach a nadir. That's been shown in a number of studies. In fact, I've got a talk on it on Saturday, so I've just looked at it. However, radiotherapy is a completely different ball game because clearly it's not been shown. We don't really know where the PSA reduction there comes from. It presumably comes from both the benign and the malignant cells. However, in the PCBD trial, there was some data which suggested that patients where the PSA dropped faster had a less chance of having a prostate cancer than those where it dropped slower. This is clearly refuted in REDUCE. In REDUCE, we have very systematic biopsies after two and four years, whereas in PCBD, it was over a seven-year period, and usually for cause-driven. And I think one can clearly refute that the speed of drop in the first six months does not say anything about the likelihood of having prostate cancer or not. Hmm? Well, well, no, it does not say anything. It does not say anything. No correlation at all. And we only have data for four years from REDUCE. Presumably, if you look at eight years, it goes down even further. What happens is that the prostate just involutes, continuously loses its uh, androgen receptor-driven um, activity and gets smaller and smaller. And that's the big attraction in patients who have BPH, for example. The disease comes to a standstill. But we know that many of the patients with BPH also have malignant cells in there. Probably both the malignant and the benign cells respond very similarly, but we don't know that precisely. Okay. Great. Thanks to everybody.